from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening. I'm Ann McLean from the library's concert office. Tonight we welcome John Zwed for a lecture called Painting Jazz. We're very fortunate to have Mr. Zwed at the library this spring. He's in residence with us now as a Library of Congress jazz scholar through the generous support of the Riva and David Logan Foundation, which is also underwriting tonight's concert by Steve Coleman and Five Elements. This week in the Music Division, we've had the pleasure of sharing with him some of our remarkable jazz treasures from the collections here. Author, journalist, and critic, John Zwed is admired for a terrific series of brilliantly perceptive books, to date 18, including acclaimed portraits of major figures in jazz. They're books both authoritative and provocative that exhibit an enviably comprehensive knowledge and a very personal experience and expression. These include So What? The Life of Miles Davis, Alan Lomax, The Man Who Recorded the World, and Billie Holiday, The Musician and the Myth. He has a distinguished academic background, receiving Guggenheim and Rockefeller Foundation awards, and teaching at a number of prestigious universities. At Yale, John Zwed was John M. Musser Professor of Anthropology, African American Studies, and Film Studies for 26 years. He was also Louis Armstrong Professor of Jazz Studies at Columbia University, and Editor-in-Chief of the website Jazz Studies Online. And I wanted to be sure to mention, given the library's historic connection with Jelly Roll Morton, that he won a Grammy for Dr. Jazz, a wonderful book published with the landmark Rounder Records box set, Jelly Roll Morton, the complete Library of Congress recordings. So please welcome John Swed. <clears throat> Thank you, Anne, for that uh, generous, over-generous uh, introduction. Thank you all for coming. I, I, I don't take that lightly. Um, what I'd like to do, what I'd like to accomplish is to, first of all, suggest that there's a tradition between, a tradition that involves both jazz and, and painting, which is much richer and deeper than is normally thought, and that there's an affinity between these two arts that um, is not usually paid attention to by either of the arts. And I'm, I'm fascinated by the idea of one art affecting another, but that's never been a popular subject for anyone to write about particularly, you know, comparative aesthetics, whatever one would call it. How, how literary people, for example, respond to painting and so forth. But that, that, that's part of my interest. Um, I'd also like to get across the idea that, um, uh, that I have to keep reminding myself that the high arts and the low arts, whatever they are, or what they used to be quaintly called, um, often share far more than, than they're differentiated by. And the other point, I suppose, would be to simply say that the, the enormous effect that uh, African-American aesthetics and painters and artists had on, on modernism itself, was enough to call, we even call it Afro-modernism if you wanted to, and that's my, my plan. I came on this subject when I heard people talking about uh, museums having jazz events. And they were saying something like, well, there's the death of the jazz if it's going into a museum. On the other hand, they would be saying they're just looking for new demographics. Um, well, I knew that was wrong, but I didn't know how wrong it was. For example, uh, Starting in 1940, the Museum of Modern Art had concerts and presentations on jazz every year. And as so far as I know, it has continued through all those years. Uh, going further back, 1936, uh, the San Francisco Museum of Art had courses in jazz and lectures. And several of the leading authors of books on, on uh, Picasso and Duchamp were also um, people who wrote about jazz. I'm thinking of Rudy Blesch and um, Harriet Janis. But it goes further. Um, um, I don't see how far do we want to go with this. Um, Dr. Barnes, the Barnes Foundation in 1928 was lecturing on Picasso and 
it's really his relationship to African American music. Now, I don't think he was saying, although who knows, because nothing exists from that. I don't think he was saying that one was affecting the other, but that they were sharing something. Maybe he was saying it. I don't know. I shouldn't even try to pass by so quickly on that. But you know, I think it's even further back, even before the the, the first record that we call jazz, and that itself is probably a, a wrong idea to try to figure out which one the first one is. Even before the first jazz record, at the um, Armory Show in New York in 1913, that we have the evidence of Stuart Davis, the youngest painter who was in that show. Um, he was he, in reading what he said about it shortly afterwards, I think he was only 19 or something like that, and he was in suddenly in, in with Gauguin and, and Picasso and the like. Uh, I remembered that Nude Descending a Staircase, which was the thing that got all the attention that year, was standing alongside of Alexander's Ragtime Band, which was a monster hit that was changing dance, dress, everything else in sight. It was overpowering music. Anyway, this is what Stuart Davis, the young artist, said later. My objective was to make paintings that could be looked at while listening to, to a jazz record at the same time without incongruity of mood. And when he saw the Gauguin and Matisse paintings, he said, there was an objective order in those works which I felt was lacking in my own. It gave me the same kind of excitement I got from the numerical precisions of the Negro piano players in the saloons of Hoboken and Newark, and I resolved that I would quite definitely have to become, a, a, and he puts in quotes, a modern artist. And it's among his first paintings are figurative paintings of those very piano players and orchestras that he talked about, in very dark tones of, of uh, gray and uh, charcoal and the like. Um, it should be, I suppose, no surprise that, that jazz, modern art, modern dance, and motion pictures should share something since they all grew up at the same time. And you can, without too much trouble, find your way in it. For example, the other day in, upstairs in the wonderful music collection, I find um, the great drummer, Max Roach, talking about how all the beboppers were going to see Fantasia over and over again. <laughs> and he was in some detail about that. And why not? I mean, um, oh, he also says, when we heard Hindemith, we said, he's one of us. We weren't playing wrong notes. I love him. <laughs> anyway, the word jazz at the time, I'm talking now back into teens and 20s, had a um, patina of, that was not a, uh, it, it had a, um, it reverberated a kind of modernism that was beyond music. And in fact, it was often used in such a way that it didn't refer to music. And uh, there's some documentation that's pretty severe about this showing how just far, how far this went. People would put up signs at a bar that said jazz. It had no jazz there, but they also put up escalator, um, sex appeal, cocktails, gramophone, it would be just cool, you know, this is it. This is a modern stuff. But I remind you that certain rappers started to be known as jazz, including Jay-Z. I don't know why he changed that, maybe for some reasons that uh, we don't want to know about. But at any rate, uh, there was, um, the word had this kind of, of um, a signal of modernity. And when, it, when it appeared in its early forms of ragtime, the talk about the music became a kind of obsession, or at least an obsession with me when I go backward over it, and a major controversy. If you ever have the curse to read everything written about jazz before 1930, which I've done, in English at least, you'll be astonished. It was everywhere and everyone was arguing and had to do not just with the music, that sometimes disappeared, had to do with what clothing you'd wear and, and what, how long a woman's hair should be and whether you'd smoke cigarettes. You get some of that at Scott Fitzgerald and, particularly in his essay, what's it called, The End of the Jazz Era, where he's really nasty about, anyone read that anymore? But he's telling you how it was awful, we were awful people. <laughs> and he says, um, one, one doesn't want to know anyone who says, yes, we have no bananas anymore. <laughs> he wanted out of it. But beyond the fashionable, you might ask, um, what was it about jazz that led to its particular impact in painting? I don't think it escaped the painters that, especially in America, the jazz was an art form that was not coming from Europe. It was quintessentially American. It was not coming from the Beaux-Arts. It was not one of the so-called pure traditions of art, and it was wide open for them to use. And the Europeans who picked up the same kind of influence were coming from a different place, but they didn't 
how can I put this? They situated their paintings in the United States. I'm thinking of, of Pete um, Mondrian and um, uh, Francis Picabia. Their paintings on jazz are all situated in the United States. And I'll come back to that in, in a second. And not in Paris, where they, so they might have heard it first. And I think once painters understood that improvisation and playing in the moment was the essence of jazz, that this seemed to resonate as an idea that might tell them something for their own practice, particularly among those who are interested in um, esoteric things or um, surrealism, where the subconscious was presumably allowed control over work and jazz could be particularly attractive in that way. Some even spoke of jazz musicians as performing under spirit possession. Then there was the impact of rhythm, which was it's hard to grasp how much it it turned heads around at that moment. It was no longer something that was underneath or behind music. It was pushing forward and front. And some picked up the fact that rhythm was itself melodic, which they could have gotten from any number of cultures, say Latin culture, for that matter, but they weren't looking there at that time. So that this is a new way to approach things. And the drum set, for example, in Europe became an art object. Uh, Jean Cocteau declared himself a jazz drummer for about three weeks, I guess, and then said it was, it was all over. Um, Francis Picabia and Darius Mio both bought drum sets and said they were jazz drummers. A uh, Man Ray had himself photographed as a one-man band. But rhythm was more than, than what the drum was, was about. It was, uh, in early jazz especially, there was something going on that was unheard of before, at least to me, it seems unheard of. One is simultaneous collective improvisation, where musicians are all playing in their own style, and they're all improvising at the same time around a, a minimal theme, and amazingly enough, never clashing, or at least in, in our ears today. That was pretty astonishing in itself. Um, I think in the broadest sense, rhythm made people think about space and perspective and and rhythm. Listen to this excitement of discovery in a 1933 article titled No More Perspective by the French designer and arts writer uh, René Gruyère. In jazz, all elements are brought to the foreground. This is an important law that can be found in painting and stage design in films and in poetry of this period, 1930s. Conventional perspective with its fixed focus and its gradual vanishing point has abdicated. In jazz, it's not the accompaniment in song that's similar to a figure against a background. In jazz, everything works. There's not a solo instrument against the background orchestra, and each instrument solos while participating in the whole. Each person plays for themselves in general ensemble. The same law applies to art. The background is itself a volume, that is to say, uh, a three-dimensional self. A decade later, Sergei Eisenstein, in his book Film Sense, summarized that same article by noting that jazz had multiple perspectives instead of a single fixed perspective and had erased the strict lines between foreground and background. And then he added, we have only to glance at Cubist paintings to know we've already seen this in jazz records. Uh, I, this is strong talk. I don't know how it strikes you, but it's just people reaching right across the arts and saying something is happening here that's much bigger than, than we've been perceiving at this point. Well, some of this jazz painting connection, um, well, I, I, I don't think I'm going to just, we're going to talk about the sociological aspects, that the fact that in New Orleans, um, virtually every jazz musician was also a, a house painter, a carpenter, they still are for that matter. And I've seen some of their business cards, you know, and, and they're kind of interesting to see. They'll say things like, um, um, I don't know what you call plaster, what, what is a person who, who sculpts in plaster, does woodwork in plaster? Um, <laughs> well, whatever, um, that kind of thing. And then down at the bottom of the card, it'll say clarinet player. It's like <laughs> you can use the same card for, for multiple purposes. Uh, that kind of thing brought together people who were good in several arts at once. But you could see the same thing happen in the 1950s at places like Stanley's Bar or the Cedar Bar or the Five Spot where artists and musicians were talking about these things in various ways. And it's not surprising, I guess, to see that a number of painters like uh, Franz Klein or Frank Stella or Norman Lewis, or both of the Kunings, would have oblique references in paintings that aren't exactly the way a word may be in one painting or, the, or just a title, a 
five spot or something. They're, they're memorializing this particular encounter they're having. Now, there's a long history and complex history of comparison between music and painting and many attempts at turning, uh, making sound visible. But even if we limit ourselves to considering only the subset of these people who were inspired enough by jazz to, to uh, render it into painted images, the variety of what they did was very impressive. And what I want to do for the rest of the time is talk about a few of these painters, Francis Picabia, uh, Arthur Dove, um, Pete uh, Mondrian, uh, Stuart Davis, Harry Smith, Jeff Schlanger, and Robert Ryman. And um, when I can, I'm using musical examples that we know they were listening to when they painted it and actually said it was part of the painting. That's kind of hard to find, but I found a few and we'll bring them up as they can. Uh, one of the first, let's get going here. One of the first is um, a painting done by uh, Picabia, just had a big show in, um, in New York and he, very colorful fellow who was supposed to be over here making deals with um, the Cubans, he's on his way to Cuba to make deals to get to get sugar cane for sugar for, the, for World War One, but he, he he put it off for months and stayed in the village where he was drinking and um, carousing and listening to music and so forth until his wife wrote him that he was about to be course marshaled. That would mean he'd be shot because he never did what he was supposed to do in the army and he went on. Uh, he, he's remembered today as a collector of 120 some cars and so forth. But I'm fascinated by the fact that. Um, he went to a Harlem cabaret during his first week in New York in 1913 when his own show was on. And this painting is one of the two that resulted from it. It's called uh, Chanson Negre. This is number one and the other is two. Now, we don't know what he was listening to except it's, it was about a singer at that cabaret, he said, which moved him deeply. Uh, when he was asked by a New York uh, Times, uh, Times, Herald Tribune reporter to explain the principles of abstraction, he says, does the musical composer attempt a literal reproduction of the landscape scene, of its details of form and color? No, he expresses it in sound waves. And as there are absolute sound waves, so there are absolute waves of color and form. Now, abstractions of music that were, as a subject, is no, no surprising thing and not a big thing. And, you know, go back to the 19th century, Walter Pater's uh, insistence that all, all great arts what, aspire to the status of music. And, um, that's, that kind of thing has been floating around a long time. I'd only add here that um, written music is itself already an abstraction of music. And when you get to jazz, when people are playing off of just chord indicators, it gets even more abstract. Well, in New York, Picabia met the young American painter Arthur Dove, and they found they were using similar forms and repeated arcs in their work to suggest rhythm in their mus music paintings as well as similar colors. Arthur Dove in the 20s did paint from recordings and daringly attempted to produce works that were the visual equivalent of the feelings and sensory qualities involved in the acts of playing music, recording it, and listening to it all on a single canvas. And that meant that in some of his paintings, you can actually see the, the, play, the playback machine, you can see sound waves, and you can see some kind of rendering of music. He's trying to do it all at once. Let me go to this one, which is Rhapsody in Blue. Uh, he was at the premiere of Rhapsody in Blue in 1924, very excited by it. It was Paul Whiteman's orchestra and uh, George Gershwin on the piano. And um, when the recordings came out, which is, if I'm right about this, it was a two-sided 78 abbreviated recording of what had happened. So that was gonna be the basis of the two paintings he would make, side, side A and side B. And this is side A, or part one, as he called it. Um, he spent days of listening and painting, he said, turning the record over and over as he worked. He said, this painting will make people see that the so-called abstractions are not abstract at all. It's an illustration. Uh, I'm not sure what he was up to there, whether he's saying, I don't, abstract is too scary, I don't want to drive people away. Um, I don't think many people would see Rhapsody in Blue in that painting, though, but he certainly heard it. Oops.
a recording, not the original, but the, the uh, recording that he was listening to at the time. And um, there's something, let me, let me go back to that. There's something odd about this painting. Um, right here is an aluminum, or it seems to be an aluminum hook. And then a, a watch spring is unraveling down there. In fact, it then turns into a painted watch spring. Can, can you see that from the sides? It's funny when you, you know, I'm not an art historian for sure, and I don't quite understand their language, but they seem to worry about, was that really, was that really uh, the clarinet being rising up, or was it really the crank of the phonograph which had a spring in it? Well, it beats me. I mean, uh, it's an abstraction, right? It's not a go with that. Um, hmm. Mondrian had already heard jazz played in black, uh, by black American servicemen in Paris after World War I and learned some of the new dances that had accompanied it. He was apparently a bad dancer, but he insisted on doing it publicly all the time. In 1927, he wrote an essay called Jazz and the Neoplastic, in which he spells out not only his plan to paint in the purest form possible, that is with straight and horizontal lines, square and rectangles, primary colors and no colors, but it's fascinating to me that he conceived of this purest of the pure art while he was listening to what many white Americans at the time thought of as the most debased of musics, jazz. But jazz, he says, now realizes an almost pure rhythm thanks to its greater intensity of sound. Its rhythm gives the illusion of being open and unhampered by form. And form and tone were his big issues. Jazz above all creates the, the nightclub's open rhythm. It annihilates form. It frees rhythm from form. The nightclub is a haven created for those who would be free of form. <laughs> I love it. When he first came to New York, he surrendered to jazz. He spent nights dancing with Lee Krasner and Peggy Guggenheim at Cafe Society. For those of you interested in tri trivia, the connection to Jackson Pollock through Krasner is interesting here. Before, you know, there's always a question if he would really like jazz and was he really painting to it, but um, whatever. There seems to have been someone there before him. Um, this is my latest discovery. He was also in Harlem at, at Minton's, an after-hour club that I believe didn't open until about four in the morning. Larry, is that right? Did it speak four? Oh, you didn't take that casually, you know. You, <laughs> you had to go there with some seriousness in mind. And he, he befriended and was befriended by Thelonious Monk. Uh, and this is the time when bebop was beginning to take over. And Monk often, according to people, some Dutch writers who were there, said, often referred to his own music in, as if it was like Mondrian's paintings. This is getting really fascinating to me. That's as far as I've gone with that. So let's look at the most famous of his paintings, Broadway Boogie Woogie. And this, they, fortunately, we have lots of pictures. I don't have them here, but lots of pictures of his studios. And they were pretty Spartan, very white these basic colors in play, and then there were easels and very neatly laid out things, and a huge pile of boogie-woogie records that he played all the time he was working. Um, he thought, um, despite his connection to bebop, that's another thing I've got to find out later, he thought boogie-woogie, especially as played by the piano trio of Albert Ammons, Mead Luck Lewis, and Pete Johnson at Cafe Society was the quintessential form of the music. I don't know why he said that exactly, although it seemed to me that that kind of music always had a kind of um, form that seemed to have no beginning, middle, and end. It was just rolling out um, like a train through the night with no, no, no particular ending in sight on it. His 1942 and 43 painting of Broadway Boogie Woogie was associated with one of those records by Ammons, Johnson, and, um, and whoever. I'm blocking it out now. Uh, let me Lex Lewis. Oops. Sorry, this is my first time using this stuff. It's scary. <laughs> History goes backwards. Thank you. 
Google this painting, you'll find dozens of people's attempts to, um, to uh, rework that, including a Pac-Man game in which the Pac-Man change color as they fuse with each other and so on, and then multi-dimensional versions of it, still obsessing people. Uh, Stuart Davis, we mentioned before, he had painting uh, jazz musicians in New Jersey when he was a kid. He, he became very close to Duke Ellington, to Earl Hines, to James P. Johnson. He actually named his two sons Earl for Earl Hines and George for George Wetling, a drummer who he, he liked, and Wetling became a painter himself of some quality later on. And if we look at uh, his work before he was really into the jazz work, you get this kind of thing, which has hints of pop art to come and so forth. These are actually two separate paintings which he presented together like that under the title of um, uh, House and Street in 1931. And I bring this up because when he did this painting in 1945 and kept working on it until 1951, he had in mind overpainting the previous painting. So if you go back and you look to the brick walls on the far side and the color up the side or over on the other side, the, um, must be the L or something over there in the yellow and building colors. You can see it still operating on the left and right side of this. Only here, now he's gotten into a thing where he writes cool, cool things on his paintings. Sometimes they're cool, sometimes they're just embarrassing. But <laughs> this one, um, this one, the mellow pad, that actually sounds like the 60s, right? But uh, the mellow pad was, he said, he was somewhere deep into this, he was doing it for years. He said, what I needed was Punch Miller's trumpet. And that's what I've got here. <laughs> I think that worked out in the paintings exactly yet. For this, I'm turning to Harry Smith, more famous as a person who changed how folk music was thought about, a very strange man. And I'm trying to write a book about it at the moment. And this is a, a kind of mandala, and it's, um, if a mandala is supposed to be about the entire universe, this is about an entire record, and the record is uh, Dizzy Gillespie's 1947 record, Lover Come Back to Me. Um, if, now, the way he operated with this painting was to put it on the floor um, using mirrors to reflect it to the side, and he would follow the, show you what the things were, were in the painting as he went along. Now, the only person alive who seemed to have paid close attention to this was uh, Jordan Belson, a filmmaker and painter, and he drafted out a, a kind of schematic of this, but it's really very minimal in trying to figure out what is what. You could sort of see that it began, it says enter on the side, but it also seems to be coming from the top, and it says slow trumpet, and then it starts around going clockwise, and you could see first solo, second solo, and so on. This is a little bit of that music. <laughs> Oh, that's 
that's the only painter I know who's ever tried to copy, well, that's not the word, he's trying to translate, to make a total translation from one form to, to another that way. Um, a contemporary painter who's a little different, um, Jeff Schlanger, who, who calls himself, um, what does he call himself, the music witness. And he paints live performances in live time. That is, he starts the second, the performance starts, and he stops when they stop. And he operates on the assumption, I think he told me, that music was the fastest means of communicating information on Earth. Oh, I'm not going to argue. And that if it takes 15 seconds to play, it takes 15 seconds to hear. So if he's painting, it takes 15 seconds to paint. Uh, what, this is Cecil Taylor. It's a, a painting called... Uh, Arc Slender, and you can sort of vaguely see to the left a pianist, and from, he's a little bit of representation, you know, figurative stuff there, but the rest of it involves him not exactly throwing paint, but moving it and then shifting the thing he's working with so it flows in various ways. Uh, it's a, no one else has tried this, and it's, um, it's to me, it's very interesting. Well, let's see, with the little time I've got left, I want to touch on Robert Ryman. Uh, Ryman was a musician who came to New York in, in the 1950s after being in the army to study with Lenny Tristano, a very cultish, not well-known pianist. I say not well-known, but you know, Time Magazine used to mention him and uh, they would call him the Bartok or the Schoenberg of jazz. Or, you know, it made no sense, but they, they throw him in. And Elvis actually encounters him in Jailhouse Rock where he's out of prison and he's being taken to uh, a house where a bunch of college professors are discussing how jazz has gone too far and how Brubeck is too far out. And then someone brings up Tristano and says, he went over the edge. And, and the professor turns to Elvis and says, what do you think, young man? And he says, frankly, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> so minor, yes, and out of it, well, you know, and he had some kind of importance. Now, when Ryman got to New York, bebop was the, the form of music that was in operation, and it was, uh, you know, uh, it was a singularly, uh, what can I say? It was aiming to be unpopular, let's put it that way. At least much of it was. It was not about, it was musical effrontery in a sense. It was self-consciously and relentlessly demanding skills and, and, and approaches that were uh, not in the, that particular genre. And one of the things they did was to, uh, by the way, they often dressed as artistes, as faux artistes with, you know, berets and, and what have you, Dizzy Gillespie especially. And, and they would throw words around like anthropology and epistrophe and ornithology. <laughs> and so, and it was, this was really exciting music to a group of ex-soldiers and those who never served because they never knew the war was on and those who were traveling one place or the other and their experiences of discrimination and dislocation, strikes and wartime. The bebop, bebop melodies and rhythms were, um, were singularly asymmetrical and jagged and then added to that was the use of uh, altered chords which they often left unresolved as one older musician who didn't like that music said to me, it's like some Somebody's wash is out on the clothesline, flapping in the wind, and it never stops flapping. That's what that music was like. It doesn't, res it doesn't resolve, you know, it doesn't go anywhere. Um, previously, jazz musicians had picked tunes, played you the tune at the beginning and at the end, and in between, they did variations on the theme so the audience would know what they were doing. These people were going in a different way. You would find uh, the stru harmonic structure of a song overlaid with another song. So Sweet Georgia Brown which could be turned into Coleman Hawkins' Hollywood Stampede or Thelonious Monk's Bright Mississippi. The old subliminal melody shimmering underneath this, um, this new one. It's what the musicologists would call um, a contrafact, um, often a form of homage or parody. But in bebop, these ghostly surfaces with something shimmering through it uh, opened up a tension that look like new possibilities were involved with it. Now, people who didn't like this music would call it Chinese music, and I was fascinated with the fact that the same people were calling uh, abstract expressionism Chinese painting. Why is the Chinese are taking the bulk of this? I don't know. In fact, someone said of, I know it was, it was um, said about John Coltrane, who had spent a lot of time studying Indian music. Shouldn't they have said Indian music? I mean, not Chinese. Anyway, Ryman, was studying this music, and then he gave it up after becoming um, 
a security guard at, at the Modern and seeing a lot of painters work. And the way he, what he chose to do, if you know his work, nearly all of it is pure white. He's been 40, 50 years of painting white. Um, he said his paintings weren't abstractions of anything. They weren't about anything except paint, if you can picture this. So he's concerned with brush strokes and the way white works. And there's a joke in here somewhere, but I, I'm not going to go into it. But at any rate, um, whenever he was talked to by arts people, he would try to answer as a musician, and they would take him off the subject. So I went back and looked up some of Here's some of it. I came from music, and I think that type of music I was involved with, jazz or bebop, had an influence on my painting. We played tunes. It's all songs nowadays, telling stories very similar to representational painting where you tell a story with paint and symbols. But bebop is a more advanced development of swing. It's like Bach. You have a chord structure, you use that to develop it in many ways. You can play written compositions and improvise off of those. So you learn your instrument, you play within a structure. It seemed logical to begin painting that way. I wasn't interested in painting a narrative or telling a story with a painting. Right from the beginning, I felt that I could do that if I wanted to, but it wouldn't interest me. Music is an abstract medium, and I thought painting should also be just what it's about and not about other things, not about stories or symbolism. And then he said, there must be something about the relationship between art and music that makes the transition from one to the other easy and natural. Maybe it's the patterns and deviation. Maybe it's the same way a jazz player plays the melody straight the first time and then rewrites it. Good art sets up a structure that everyone is familiar with, square mounted on a wall, paint on it, and then departs from the expected tune and inspires you to go home and think or blow your horn or something. Well, he went so far as to say that he wasn't going to title any of his paintings because a title would suggest something when it's just about paint. Paint is paint. And he spends a lot of time working with paint. He said, um, it would be disastrous to put a title on it. But that wasn't quite true. I found I was looking at his paintings for 10 years, he kept putting in musical titles, which he somehow wanted to forget later. Love Lines, which was the name of a Lenny Tristano piece based on Fool and Myself, a song associated with Billie Holiday. And uh, Untitled, and then behind the Untitled is Background Music in 1962, which is a Warren Marsh composition uh, based on the harmonic structure of all of me. So what I'd like to do, show you the painting as a concluding operation here. Now the problem with, this, with his white paintings is uh, you can't see what it is he wants you to see, which is what's underneath the white. But can you see a little bit of it? The first thing's coming through. Let me go back now. all of me. And this is a favorite of the musicians he worked with, and so I know he would have known this. All of me, why not take all of me? Can't you see I'm no without you Take my lips I want to lose them Take my arms I'll never use them and This is background music which is built on the harmonic structure of that piece. comments on this, but we do have comments on another painting, mainly because it was the only painting he ever did with real color. And uh, in an interview in, in London when this was being shown there, they said, well, what's happening here? I mean, this is the only thing you're really untitled, orange painting. 
he said, well, I don't remember the process. There are probably all kinds of things going on there. It didn't start off orange, I'm sure of that. <laughs> and then he pointed to the edges, particularly the upper right and to all around, but particularly up there, and he said, that's important. <laughs> On another occasion, he said more clearly, they're not white or monochromatic paintings, because people say, it's always white. I mean, you know, come on. Because of the surfaces functioning as a second color in contrast to the white of the paint. And, and then he'll spend a little time talking about, which I don't need to go into, about, about um, no, here's one more I'll give you. It was a matter of making the surface very animated, giving it a lot of movement and activity. This was done not just with the brushwork and the use of quite heavy paint, but with color which was subtly creeping through the white. So he's rather modest about his work and about what he's done with this stuff, but it seems to me he's creating the visual equivalent of the form and organization of a certain type of jazz and one that was originally developed in interaction with other people through performance rather than solitary composition. That raises the question of why would you listen to records when you do these things if you're not actually going to copy them? Uh, you, I, I'd like to suggest without any more evidence in my guessing that it puts you in interaction with the musicians in some way. So you see this in Jackson Pollock's almost dancing swirling, but there were other more uh, simpler ways to do that, just with brush strokes and the like. Uh, this, this kind of music that I'm talking about, which is learned while you're, you're playing with others primarily, rather than solitary composition, creates a kind of an aesthetic through performance, and the music is something of an ethic as well as an aesthetic, because you, you're, you're dealing with other people. And I think Ryman is alluding to that ethic in this work, and it may also tell us why he paints with listening to music like he does. Well, that's the general argument of running out of time, and I thought I could summarize this, but instead of summarizing it, I'll just give you an anecdote which won't quite handle what I'm talking about, but nonetheless, it's this. Um, Elaine Kooning, uh, Elaine Kooning and, and Willem de Kooning were big, um, big jazz fans to start with. She did a painting of actually uh, charcoal of Ornette Coleman, which was quite realistic for her, quite, quite clear it was what it was, and signed it and gave it to Ornette. Uh, my wife and I were at a party at Ornette's once, probably on New Year's Eve or something, and he gave out copies of this to everybody, which was great to have because there was only one of them out there. But he had erased her name and put his name in. <laughs> and when asked about it, he said, it was my picture. <laughs> but do any of you know the story about Rauschenberg erasing de Kooning? You know, Robert Rauschenberg got the idea as a young guy, it would be cool to erase something of one of his seniors. So he went to de Kooning and said, have you got a drawing I could erase? And de Kooning thought he was nuts, you know, this is crazy. So he just kept badgering him, said, just something I could do something with. So he gave it one, and by the way, it's not completely erased, but you, can, you know, it's mostly there. And then he signed it, you know, Robert Rauschenberg. Well, I suppose this is getting even with, from both sides of the Rauschenberg thing coming back to it. So my point, again, is the role of these arts in interacting with each other, which I don't think has been properly dealt with, the, the role of African Americans at the base of this music, and whatever else you get out of it. Thank you very much. <laughs>